Hey everyone, it is 12.14 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on August the 8th. Yeah, 2021, so-called. What you're seeing on the screen right now is the homepage for my Odyssey account. Um, yeah, I got a couple comments so far today. I hope that everyone who hears this will go. I put the link up in the... Um, the posts, the community posts on YouTube. Um, and, you know, hopefully when I, um, hopefully if I'm able to upload this without too many problems to BitChute, those people who follow me there will come to Odyssey as well. BitChute has become nearly impossible for me to upload anything uh, very substantial to, and I try uploading very small files. Uh, even though there, you know, could be a few hours long or whatever, I try to reduce the file size as much as possible. And it's still such a chore and takes so long to try to, um, to constantly try uploading videos to BitChute that just continually fail. They do not process and publish. I tried contacting them about this, and they wanted me to buy a, a subscription to BitChute, so I guess I have to pay them to upload. And I don't know if that's a guarantee, and, you know, BitChute recently um, published new guidelines, which gives them the free reign to bar uh, content if they find it to be hate speech and hateful which everybody knows what that means that just means that you can't talk about the jews you can't be honest uh with your content you can't say what you think and that's all hate speech is i remember years ago before i ever got online uh, and started researching and creating content where I heard about these things, hate, it's, it's hate speech or a hate crime. I mean, that was in the air because they were setting everything up for that. And I remember thinking even back then, and I didn't know anything about anything back then. I remembered thinking back then how stupid that was. Um, e you know, even when I, I really didn't know anything uh, about what was going on, who the players were, who they were, who I was, um, or just how much had been destroyed, hidden, changed. I remember thinking those things were ridiculous. And yeah, it, it's true. I've, I've always been somebody who says the things that nobody else either has the nerve to say or, you know, I have plenty of filters, believe me. Um, I absolutely know how to tame my conversations. It's, it's not like one of those Asperger-y things. But, you know, that sort of, it, and, and you know what, back then they were calling it politically correct. That's what it was back then. And I hated it back then. And I hated it when I was in high school because that's when politically correct was coming around was when I was high school. I graduated in 93 and it was around then. And I thought it was the stupidest thing. Um, I had friends that, well, I don't know, um, portended to be free thinking and they weren't. And they were politically correct, and they were very well trained. And apparently the same thing has continued with the uh, so-called friends I had after that, who are today very well trained as well. So this is the platform that I know of, that I'm on, that actually offers um, some kind of freedom. And, you know, with YouTube, it's, it's really obvious they do mess with metrics. Uh, they do mess with comments. Comments are routinely deleted. There is no way 
even with the amount of subscribers I have and the number of videos that, that have gotten a lot of views, there's just no way I, I would be able to monetize at YouTube without everything going downhill probably very fast. And maybe now that I have this set up at, at Odyssey, I might just switch over to monetization and see how fast it, you know, crashes and burns. I, I don't know. I really don't. So yeah, I put that link. I will, uh, I'll actually include that Odyssey link in the, uh, the description. Odyssey, Odyssey has a function. It's kind of in, in beta right now where you can live stream. And I've considered doing uh, a live stream. I don't know weekly or if it will just be whenever. I'd like to try to schedule it at a time that would be good. And then I can interact with people. Um, you can ask me questions or if I can set up a chat. I don't actually know a lot about what live streaming softwares are out there and available. I spend a lot more of my time really in just raw research. So understanding the software and the technical end of it, I'm, I'm behind on as compared to probably a lot of other content creators out there who really know what they're doing as far as software and what's available, how to do it, so on and so forth. So any suggestions uh, as far as what would be, for instance, um, Odyssey requires that you you download a live streaming software and then you can link it up. It looks a lot like uh, how things were in the early days of YouTube doing live streams. If anybody remembers the early days of YouTube's live streams, it would be a link up with Google Hangouts. And then there would be a few second delay, maybe five or 10 second delay between that and the live stream actually going on on YouTube. So you could see the chat there, there would be that delay though. And then when YouTube brought it to where they offered the live stream, then you didn't have the chat delay. But you really couldn't do as much in YouTube with your screen, what you could do with your screen, so on and so forth. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't, it was kind of a little better, but not, not that much better. So I'm trying to figure out how to go about this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to keep going through Luke. I'm, I don't know how myopic I'm going to get in a lot of these parts. I did want to give you a quick rundown. We did talk about chronology and how chronology is important. It really is important. Geography and topography are important. We discussed that too. Matthew says he was on the mountain. Luke says he was on a plane. That's different. That's significantly different. Um, let's see. So um, here's the thing. If we started with the love your enemies portion of Luke, and I gave you the, uh, the subheadings from Matthew, and I'm going to give you a, a kind of a good idea of how much these concepts are actually spread throughout Luke to where they, they don't have anywhere near uh, the sort of continuity and certainly not, you know, chronology that Matthew has. The giving to the needy portion of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount is found in Luke 16, 15. The Lord's Prayer is found in Luke 11, 1 through 13. Big difference in chronology there. The fasting portion isn't found in Luke at all, not that I could find. Lay up treasures in heaven, Luke 12, 33. Do not be anxious, Luke 12, 22. Close, wrong chronology, but they're close together. The ask and it will be given can be found in Luke 11, 9 through 13. The golden rule, Luke 6, 31. That's a big difference. Um, and then they, Luke actually kind of blends some concepts that you'll find a little more spread out or, or more elaborated on in Matthew. And then the way they end, it's again, it's similar, but Luke seems to sort of condense what 
Matthew says. In Matthew 7, 28 and 29, it reads, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. As compared to Luke 4.32, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. All right. I'll give that to him. That's fine. But I did write a note in here, and this is, I think this is very appropriate. My note was that after comparing those two portions that are, they're supposed to be parallels. I noted that it, it's all as if Luke took Matthew's Sermon on the Mount as if he already had that. And he took that, the text of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, sliced it up, threw it into the air, lost a number of the pieces, then stitched it back together, and cut out pieces he didn't like. He writes that Yusho says, Judge not, lest you be judged, but fails to include the qualifying remarks from Yusho on judging, as in Yusho, Jesus. He, he gives us the qualifiers to judging. We're never, ever, told not to judge that, that that's i actually heard at at a a sunday school that that a church building that we were involved with a, a little while ago one of the associate pastors teaching not to judge and i thought my head was going to explode because i i literally thought that's like that is bottom of the barrel church stuff like if you're in a church that literally teaches you not to judge others that is, you are in the most bottom-of-the-barrel church building there is. You need to, to get out of there as fast as possible. Because you can't even have a brain and teach that. You can't even have a brain and learn that. Because the impossibility of not judging is so absolute that just the fact that some church buildings even still teach that is just a marker at how out of touch with actual reality they are. And so the thing is, let's see, it is, just to give you the, the actual, I'm sorry, the actual text, which I think is in the Sermon on the Mount in Luke. I know that's silly. I didn't actually put the... Um, Oh, I didn't actually put the verse in here. Can you believe that? Um, well, I'm in the wrong chapter. That's part of the problem. I do that sometimes. Luke 6.37 Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaken together. And running over shall men give into your bosom, for the same measure shall ye meet. With all it shall be measured to you again. That is seriously what you get from Luke. If you were reading the Gospel of Luke and you didn't have another Gospel, because that's the thing. I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of people read these Gospels and they don't immediately go, What? What? What is he talking about? The, all right. <clears throat> the whole reason that most of the tribes of Israel were carried away is because, first off, they weren't judging appropriately. Their bad behavior, the bad behavior of the people around them, their nation in general, and doing something about it as according to the law. So you understand, if I were to read Luke and I didn't have the other Gospels, specifically Matthew, maybe, maybe Mark, I'm not going to talk about John right now, but if I didn't have those to, to compare this to, because that's, that's the issue we don't think about, because all of us, our whole lives, we've had these four Gospels. So when we read another one of the Gospels, when we read Mark, which is kind of like uh, skinny Matthew, sort of, or when we read Luke, and Luke is quite different than Matthew in many ways, 
or John, which is just way different than all of them. What we do is, if we're not getting out of one of those other Gospels, those um, precepts, those dogmas that we've been taught, well, that's okay, because we can just go and refer to another Gospel where we will find it. Now, you know there's a number of precepts that we've been taught in modern Christianity that you can't find in Matthew either, that are only to be found in these other Gospels. Now, you can't honestly think that people have always had all four Gospels, or even more than four Gospels, if you like the other Gospels, like Thomas, and there's more than that floating around out there. Um, I haven't really taken the time to read many of them. They call them Gnostic Gospels, but I, I really don't care what they call them. Um, I would like to read them for myself. I, I really just haven't. I've read bits and pieces. So I can't, I'm sorry, I can't intelligently comment on, on those other ones if I haven't read them. I don't know. But there's a good, I, I think, a, a pretty good clear indication of just how massively different they are. And maybe that's a good exercise. Um, next time anybody's listening, if you were to read any gospel... And that does include Matthew, because, you know, I took just about the entire video, the last one I made, commenting on that portion of Matthew, which certainly does appear to be in contradiction of the law. And we have to reconcile that without twisting it. And if we can't, we have a problem. Well, where's the problem? Is the problem in the text? Has the text been changed from the original text? These are questions that should be asked, and we need to find answers for them. Because if we don't find answers for them, I, really, how strong is somebody's faith when, when they're willing to just not even, not even really pay appropriate attention to, you know, serious questions? Okay, so I would like to move forward a little bit. Some of these things I, I'm going to drive over kind of fast because they're they're just they're really just reinforcing concepts I've talked about so far, which is problems with chronology and things like that. Some of these things I'll stop on a little bit so we can take just a little closer look at, but a lot of these just kind of driving over them fast. Um, you there is a difference in in chronology immediately after the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Matthew's chronology has him cleansing the leper. That's right after the Sermon on the Mount, and that picks up in Matthew 8, 1 through 4. Luke immediately goes into the account with the centurion. Um, he put the cleansing of the leper, Luke put the cleansing of the leper before the Sermon on the Mount, and that is a significant chronological issue. Um, Luke's account of the centurion is different than Matthew's account, and it's certainly worthy worthy of a, of a bit of review, okay? And I can start with Luke's, since we're looking at Luke. Now, in Luke 7, 1, it says, when he had uh, ended all of his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. Okay, that's, it's the same with Matthew. It says he came into Capernaum. Matthew 8, 5, when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him. Now, this is important because this is a big uh, point of divergence. When he entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. That's Matthew 8, 5 through 7. What does Luke say? Okay, he entered into Capernaum. Then, and a certain centurion's servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. I didn't know people died from palsy. I mean, over a really long period of time. But anyway, so Luke 7, 3. And when he heard of Jesus, the centurion, he sent unto him elders of the Jews. Really? The Jews? Are you sure? Or is it Judeus? I just... We just got to look. Is it Jews or is it Wudeon? It's Wudeon. 
That's of Judah. That's not a Jew. It's Udeon. If you see this root, Iota, Omicron, Upsilon, Delta, Alpha, Iota, or or you don't even need that that last Iota. Just that Uda. That is a Greek Koine Greek transliteration of Judah. It's never. Jew as we know Jew today. People who parse those out and try to figure out when it's the when it's the uh, a nationalistic term and when it's not. All right, understand this so we can be clear on this because it's important. This is very important. In the Old Testament, you will be hard pressed to find many people who are ever referred to simply by where they're living. The thing is, when people, and, and, and this is a common thing, Jews do this. Now, here's the big difference. We have today's Jews, okay? And what a lot of people believe is that when we see Jews, in the New Testament, we have to try to figure out, does that mean Jew, like the Jew today, or does that mean Judah, as in the Germans today, and maybe part of the Irish, uh, de Jüdisch, Deutsch. The problem with that is, see, even the Jews do it. You can uh, watch the informal debate that Michael Brown who is a, a so-called Christian, he's a converso, and he's a Jew, that he has with E. Michael Jones. E. Michael Jones is exactly right in one way and then exactly wrong in another. E. Michael Jones cuts right through his BS because you, you guys have to understand the ones who are, are trying to say that, well, sometimes it just means nationalistic and, and sometimes it means Judah and you got to pay attention to which one of the Greek suffixes and ways it's used. No, I'm no. They, look, there's about 23, 22 variations of the root uh, Uda in the Greek, in Koine Greek. Okay, they're all just variations of aspects. They're, they're, they're variations of noun, verb, concept kind of things. They don't necessarily signal to you that it's a nationalistic term or a genetic term. Okay? Yuda is Yuda. And it's just a transliteration of Yuda from the Obery Old Testament. That's all it is. Now, if somebody said that there was a man who lived in Uda, then you might not be able to tell who he was genetically. But if you compare this with the Old Testament, when it's talking about Uda, somebody who is of Uda, Udim, that is the tribe of Judah. That's how the land. The land is the land, but the people are the people, okay? When all of those people were moved in by, whether we're talking about Asher, the Assyrians, whether we're talking about the Kajdim or Babel, the Babylonians, um, when they moved those people in, they were never considered Israel. They were never considered Ephraim. They were never considered Naphtali or Asher or anything else. They would be called Shomroni because of the governant there. Now, Shomron has nothing to do with genetics. It's a locale. Okay? That's very important. People are distinguished in the New Testament by who they are genetically. That's why we can see, for instance, Canaanites. These Canaanites lived in either Judah or Shomron. This is the problem. That... I see the vast majority of people who teach on, on the New Testament, whether 
whether they're coming from a perspective of Christian identity or Judeo-Christianity, the perspective is not all that different. It, the biggest difference in, in the perspective between, let's say, the Judeo-Christian and Christian identity is who they perceive the Jew to be. But both of these sects, and including the Jew, they're all looking at it like this. They all play these word games where they say, well, you know, you can't just look at Yuda as Judah, and of course they call it Jew, which is totally incorrect. It's Judah. Anytime you see that root, that's Judah. That's referring to Judah. It's not referring to Jew as we know Jew today. I don't even know how many of those people we're talking about Ashkenazim were even in the land at this time. The Sephardim? Sure. The Sephardim are different than the Ashkenazim. They are clearly, they're physically different, and unless they've mixed with the Ashkenazim, some have. They're different. The Sephardim, I would say, certainly were in the land at that time. But that's a big problem. And I, I really wanted to address that. And, and here's why. Look, the whole reason that, the, that Judah, which did include a certain portion of Benjamin, it, it included a certain portion of Levi, I have no reason to not believe it, it, it included a certain portion of Simeon. Because one of the judgments that Jacob pronounced on Simeon, it was on Simeon and Levi, that they would be absorbed into the rest of the nation for what they did to him in the land of Shechem. So anyways, these people were all considered Judah, Judah. When they rejected the salvation provided to them by Yahweh, at some point after that is when the judgments came. Judgments that Yusho spoke of in Matthew 24, the judgments that we see starting out in the book of Revelation. If, if when we see Udeon, Udeos, all of the different variations of the root Uda, if we were to consider that as the Jew, as we know the Jew today, then we don't have any way of identifying why Judah too, for some time, besides Israel, was under a judgment. And many, um, many terrible things befell Judah. Remember, Judah was being kept in the land, which included Benjamin, very, and not all of Benjamin. Part of Benjamin was with Israel. Part of Judah actually was carried off by Asher. Two. Okay. So what portion of Judah was left? They were being kept intact until the coming of the promised one, Yusho. And then when, as a nation, they rejected him, put him to death, that was it. After they had killed and and uh, persecuted so many of their prophets up until that point. That was that was it. And now judgment was going to come. And a number of the prophecies from the Old Testament, the uh, the Old Testament prophets was were going to come to pass. One of them being the land sitting desolate for so long, which Palestine never has sat desolate. It's always had a population of people. But this land would go through a lot of tumultuous upheavals, it would appear from the language being used, not only in Matthew 24, but Revelation, that it would be natural upheavals, that the people would be taken away, there would be terrible wars that would be fought, the people would go to another far-flung land uh, and, and be in slavery and servitude to this other people. That would be Europe, that would be parts of Asia. I have absolutely no reason, whenever I look at Udeos in the Koine Greek in the New Testament, to see it as anything other than Judah. Judah, the genetic people of 
Judah. There are two houses. There is Israel, sometimes called Ephraim, and that represents a number of tribes. And then there is Judah, which represents a number of tribes. Far less, of course. Mostly Judahites, some Benjamites, some Levites, probably some Shimuni or Simeonites. I really wanted to bring that up because I, I haven't addressed that yet. And the problem I, I often see is that when people look at Wudeos and Wudeon and they see Jew as we understand Jew today, they're making a great error, no matter if it's the evangelical, no matter if it's the uh, identitarian, and especially the Jew, because it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what you could really argue to somebody are the failings of the Jew, as long as they believe the Jew as we understand them today, the Ashkenazim, the Sephardim, even the Mizrahi, as long as they understand those people and think those people are the Judah of the Bible, you're never going to get through to them. I promise you. You're never going to get through to them because they're always going to think, well, you know, they may be awful and they may be trying to kill me and my family and friends and stuff, but, you know, God's chosen people. And so it's always going to work against us. Always, always, always. And I'm not telling you here is another tactic. We need to try another tactic. I'm telling you this is far closer I'm using far closer because I'm, I'm being mild about it. Far closer to the truth than the other method, which really doesn't add up. When you cross-reference these, it doesn't add up because it, at some points, and, and it can be the same form of Uda. A at some points, it works really well for this idea that that's the Jew, and at other points, it doesn't. And then same thing, if, if you just insert Judah into all of those instances, it works. It absolutely works. So, I really had to do that as an aside, and I'm sorry, but it's just something I haven't addressed yet, and, and I really needed to. So anyways, in Luke 7, it says that when he heard this, he sent to him elders of Judah, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. Now, that is absolutely different. Okay, Matthew says that he came to him. Okay, and then after this in Luke 7, 4, it says, And when they came to Yusho, Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying, that he was worthy for whom he should do this. They're talking him into it. For he loves our nation. He's built us a really a synagogue. Now, if you were to read Shem Tob's Hebrew Matthew, I don't know how close to the original that is, but it literally is a version of Matthew in Hebrew, block Assyrian script Hebrew, not Obri, but Hebrew you'll see that he does not use synagogue. He uses the appropriate terms, mu'od for assembly or kwel for assembly, where we most likely where the Greek word ekklesia came from, ekkel, ekkel, kwel. Okay, that's what Shem Tov puts in there, not synagogue. It's another Jewy edition, synagogue. And, you know, i got to tell you guys, w with as much language as we've lost, um, as far as how different ancient Greek was from whatever this abominable Koine Greek, in fact, is, there's so much we've lost, I would not be surprised how much synagogue can be traced back to Eastern Asia and the practices of those pagan people. Gog. The synagogue. Anyways, so Jesus went with them, and uh, so it's different. He didn't reply to them as he did to the centurion himself in the account of Matthew. Um, when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him. The, the centurion is still not coming to him himself like he is in Matthew, saying to him, Lord, trouble not yourself, for I'm, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. 
What? He said what in Luke 7, 7? Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee? But say in a word, and my servant will be healed. Hold on a minute. Let me go back to Matthew. And when Jesus was come into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Oh my gosh. Listen. If I was a judge, and I was hearing a case, and two people came in and they said, We're, These are both witnesses for the defense, Your Honor. And that first witness sits down and he says to me, Well, yeah, I can tell you exactly what happened. You see, um, this guy came to me and he said such and such. And so I said to him this and, and that's what happened. All right. Next witness. And the next witness comes up and he says, Yeah, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Because I saw it. And... Um, this guy came to him, uh, or I'm sorry, this guy, he sent uh, a group of guys to this guy, and they talked him into it, and then when he was on his way there, he sent some other guys there to talk to him. Oh, yeah, no, no, that guy, he never actually came and talked to him. What, did the last guy tell you that? That really, really would ruin the veracity of the testimony I was hearing. It's literally a different account. It is a different account. It's not complimentary. It's literally saying something completely different. So we can move forward. Okay, one, one quick thing too. In Luke 7, let's see. I lost it because my phone started ringing. Luke 7, 11 through 17. The dead widow's son in Nain. That's to be found nowhere else. I don't even think this uh, this location, Nain, is to be found anywhere else. I don't even think I can find an equivalent to it in the Old Testament, Nain. And I've listed all of the locations from the Old Testament. I don't think I can find an equivalent to that. It's not to be found anywhere else. This The, the account of the dead widow's son, not to be found anywhere else. So, it's really kind of interesting. When you get past that, Luke's account has the, it's the John's disciples coming to him. It's Luke 7, 18. Now, one thing that's interesting is that appears in Matthew, three chapters ahead of the incident with the centurion, and a whole lot of stuff happens between that. Remember what I said before, these things that are going on, they take time. So, if you have three chapters of all sorts of things being done in those three chapters difference, that is all sorts of time that you have chronologically got very, very different, and that matters. But something that's even more interesting, in Luke's account, when John's disciples come to Jesus, you show. In Luke's account, Yusho doesn't even compare John the Baptist to Elijah. I wrote Elisha in my notes. Elijah. Now, why is that important? Well, okay, in Matthew, he's going on. The accounts have some language that's similar between Luke and Matthew. But in Matthew's account, Yusho's going on talking about John the Baptist, and he says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, and I have to assume he means Elijah, not Elisha, which was to come. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, this is why it's really important, and Luke doesn't mention it. If I was reading Luke by itself without the other Gospels present, which, who says everybody had 
any and all of the gospel accounts at any given time where they could compare these things. So imagine the damage that a gospel that was radically different than the closest thing to the real, actual, trustworthy account, the one that is most like the rest of the scriptures, which we call the Old Testament. Imagine how damaging that gospel would be to somebody who had nothing else that did not have the three synoptics and then John all together to compare them, how damaging that might be. Because here's why it's so important, because if we refer back to Malachi, we can see the prophecy from Malachi. Behold, I will send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful. And here it is, Yom Yahweh. We can reference Yom Yahweh. Unfortunately, Strong's doesn't do us the favor, as great a, a tool as it's supposed to be, it doesn't do us the favor by showing us all of the entries referring to Yom Yahweh. We might get a certain amount of those entries if we select a verse and TSK cross-reference shows us a number of them. One of the prophets that was prophesying to Israel before they started being carried away in such mass numbers by Asher was Amos. And Amos did prophesy as well as a number of other prophets concerning Yom Yahweh. Yom Yahweh was to be a time of terrible burden, terrible trouble, terrible loss for the people of Israel. And here in Malachi, Malachi, one of the later prophets is prophesying about the coming of Elijah before Yom Yahweh, the great gadul and dreadful day of Yahweh. Which I pose to you that that is precisely what Yusho was foreshadowing in Matthew 24 and what we are seeing being outlined throughout the book of Revelation. Yom Yahweh. He would send Elijah the prophet before Yom Yahweh. What's interesting actually is the version that we even have today of Matthew must have varied from the version that they had a few hundred years ago when Shem Tov's Matthew was written in block Assyrian script Hebrew. Because actually in that one, Yusho has more remarks in, indeed on John and his comparison with Elijah. So that's very significant if you leave that out. And Luke does. Now, you have Luke 1.17, He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of their fathers to their children, disobedient wisdom to the just, to make ready a people, prepared for the day of the Lord. So you have something that's, that's close, right, in Luke? Similar. It's kind of close. Maybe you get kind of that same message. It's right in Luke 1.17, though, and it's out of context. I mean, radically out of context. But if you're somebody who's sold on Luke, I guess you can salve your wounds by pointing out that, yes, we can find it somewhere in Luke, and um, chronology doesn't matter. Now, this next one, you can't, you can't sweep under the carpet. This one's really, really significant here, okay? The next thing we see happening in Luke is subheading in bold. You know, a sinful woman forgiven. In Luke's account, it says that one of the Pharisees desired that he would eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to meet. And behold, a woman of the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Yusho sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. Now, the, the account is quite long, Okay, and um, he answered, now, okay, so now when the Pharisee had bidden him, he saw it, he spake within himself, saying, if this man, if he were a prophet, 
he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touched him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answered and said, Simon, I have somewhat to say to you. And he says, Master, say on. He's speaking to the Pharisee. Calls him Simon. Now he gives him a quick story. Creditor, two debtors. One owed 500 pence, the other 50. Okay. And Simon answered and said, I suppose that he who forgave the most, and he said, you've judged rightly. Now, this is a long account. I don't want to go word for word through this entire account. I just want to bring the differences up to you so that you know that when you look at this yourself. The problem is that if we want to find the parallel account to this in Luke 7, we have to jump all the way forward to Matthew 26. It's that different. It's Matthew 26. Now in Matthew 26, it says, now this, this is like right at the end, because the, the, the subheading before this in Matthew 26, one is the plot to kill you show. Okay? That's how far along we are in Matthew. Now in Luke, the next thing we have in Luke after this is women accompanying him. We've got parables of the sower. Um, and then Jesus calms the storm in Luke 8, 22. He heals a man with a demon. This is not, this is way before he's in Jerusalem. And there's the plot to kill him and all that stuff. Way, way, way before that, that we see this, him with this woman who anoints his feet. She had a box. It says he, she had a box of ointment. Okay. Now, and he's speaking in this conversation, you know, this uh, this Pharisee, it says a Pharisee invited him to eat. And the Pharisee is upset because he allows this woman in and he doesn't know that she's, a, you know, whatever she is. And then it says, when when you shows having this this uh, this back and forth with this Pharisee who he calls Simon, Luke says he's Simon. Um, it says that you shall turn to the woman. He said to the woman, see, see thou, or said to Simon, I'm sorry, said to Simon, see thou this woman, I entered into your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Yeah. You gave me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I, I've, I'm sorry, that since I came has not ceased kiss my feet uh my head with oil you did not anoint but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment wherefore i say unto you her sins which are many are forgiven she loved much but to whom little is forgiven the same loveth now i've never really understood this whole thing why it would be a cultural thing to put oil on somebody's head when they came into your house I just don't know. I'm not going to try to speak too much on it. I wouldn't like that. I would make my hair greasy. I So I don't understand that. I understand that there's this idea of anointing with oil somebody who is an anointed one as a um, uh, a ritualistic thing. For instance, like Samuel did to David when he was anointing him king. Okay. But anyways, we go in and we're all the way forward. We're in Jerusalem. This is near the end. And starting in Matthew 26, 6. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. Simon the Pharisee becomes Simon the leper. Now here we've got Simonos. Well, I don't know if that's Simon or if maybe that's some other name because it's got a different suffix. You remember when I showed you how Yusho, his name appears in about three different forms. And its root was actually Yisu, and that's it in the Greek, Yesu, which is the equivalent of, or the transliterative equivalent of, you show from Obri. The same thing works with about any name. 
That's why I'm trying to tell you when you see Wu Dei, it's just the transliterative Koine Greek from Yu De, which means the genetic descendants of Yuda, Judah, not Jew. So this is uh, Simone II, and it is actually Lepro. He is apparently Simon the Leper, which is kind of weird, I guess. Uh, I wouldn't think you would have much judgment over a whorish woman, him being a leper and all. Well, anyways, then there came to him a woman having an alabaster box. Here's a woman with an alabaster box, a very precious ointment. He poured it on his head, on his head, yeah, as he sat at meat. But when the disciples saw it, they had indignation. It's the disciples this time. It's not Simon, and Simon's not a Pharisee. He's a leper. That's a lot of differences. If I were the judge, I would say, now this sounds ridiculous. You can't keep your stories straight. But no, what? Well, it's still basically the same. You know, it, it's got the same ending. Well, we'll see about that. To what purpose is this waste? That was his disciples. It said his disciples are saying that to him. This is Matthew. For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And when he understood it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. You have the poor always with you, but me you don't always have. For in that she had poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. This is absolutely, completely different. But it's still Simon, except he's a leper instead of a Pharisee. And this is the only parallel we have of a woman with an alabaster box of ointment, which she anoints, you show with. So it's too similar to say, nah. But the problem is, it's so radically different, you can't possibly say that those two are in harmony or are parallels. Okay, so let's do Luke 8 real quick. I've got time to just roll through Luke 8, I think. Now, the first thing is, all right, I do want to comment on Mary Magdalene. So there's this. All right. The idea of Mary Magdalene being a whore. I don't know that. Let's see. Mm, nope. No, can't find it in Matthew. I'm just trying to find out which is which is that source that makes her out to be a whore. Um, mm, no, looking for it in Mark. Already passed Matthew. Didn't find that in Matthew. Sorry. Um, don't find it in Mark. All right, in Luke, of course, in 8, where we're at, it said that she was healed of evil spirits, and that is um, the pneuma. Maybe she was healed of having a breathing disorder. It's pneuma. Um, and Luke 24.10 doesn't say she's a whore. Uh, and here we are, we're in John now. It says we have uh, Mary Magdalene. No whore. Mary Magdalene early when it was dark. No whore. Came, told the disciples, no whore. So wherever anybody's getting this idea that she was a whore, um, I'd actually like to know where that's where that's at, because I don't have a reference here, but it's it's been like seared into the popular culture's mind that Mary Magdalene's a whore. When you watch, for instance, like Mel Gibson's The Passion, and I don't think he's alone in this. I think they did this in other Jesus-y movies where they equate Mary Magdalene with the the singular account only found in John. And there are copies of John where that account doesn't even occur, by the way, older 
Because you have to understand, there are so many different copies of different New Testament books out there, and they vary a ton. They equate this Mary Magdalene with the whore. I think a lot of mythologies have been engendered about Mary Magdalene that I, I don't even know if there's references to. Now, what's interesting is just the Greek transliterative word Magdalene. That would come from Magadul. That would make her the Great. Mary the Great. So she sounds to me more like a great woman, a woman of great substance, than a whore. Correct me if I'm wrong. However, Luke 8, 3, where it says, And Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance, are saying who's with him. You can't find that anywhere else. That is not to be found in any other gospel. Now, one other kind of significant difference, I would say it was, it was significant. Again, if you're reading only Luke, you don't have these other gospels as a safety net to go in reference and say, oh, that's what he probably said. Luke must have just left it out. His bad. Now, the next thing in Luke 8 is the parable of the sower and what he has to say about the parables and why he speaks in parables and a little bit about what Luke says is going on as compared to what Matthew says is going on. And these things are all important. Now, besides the fact that we can't find these women, mentioned Luke 8, 3, and anywhere else, nobody else can verify them being present. In Luke 8, 4, it says, uh, When much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake a parable. Okay. Because you could go, and first off, we've got to rewind, by the way. We've got to rewind from Matthew 20-something when he's in Jerusalem close to his death. We have to rewind all the way back to Matthew 13 for this parable. And that's way out of chronological order, of course. Now, in Matthew, it says, And the disciples came... Oh, sorry. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Too far forward. Now, it says that uh, Matthew 13, 1, And the same day Jesus went out of the house and he sat by the seaside. Now, this is a follow-up from him being in a... a a certain house, a certain place. There were the, the incidents with the scribes and the Pharisees, the sign of Jonah. Talking about the return of an unclean spirit or perhaps a bad pneumonia. And his mothers and brothers coming to him and him saying, this is all in Matthew 12, who are my mothers and brothers. And then it says the same day he went out of the house, he sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered unto him, so he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, okay, that's interesting. To me, that's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, and I've always thought, and don't tell me you haven't thought of this, and if you haven't, why not? The projection of his voice there's a number of occurrences where it says that he was speaking to large crowds of people, really, really large crowds of people. In some instances, we got to think about the projection of his voice. Now, they would tell us that sort of old Greek and Roman amphitheaters were designed and constructed specifically to project the, the voice of the speakers, the actors, the performers throughout the entire amphitheater without any kind of um, parallels to our modern technology, which would be PA systems and things of that sort. You would create a space 
And there's a number of theaters that I've been in where they have created a space that actually have extremely good acoustics. You can actually hear somebody speaking who is on the stage. You might not be able to hear them speak clearly, and you might need a certain amount of amplification to hear them clearly, especially if you have a room full of people, because once you start filling bodies in, in an area, they actually soak up sound. Bodies soak up sound. So if you have somebody who is surrounded by people, those people are soaking up sound. I, I have to tell you, one of my favorite scenes in Monty Python's The Life of Brian is this recreation of the Sermon on the Mount, where all these people are all standing around, and you've got this Jesus character who's kind of standing on top of a rock, who's giving his beatitudes and these guys are way in the back and they don't they can't hear what he's saying and they keep trying to what is he saying did he just say blessed are the cheese makers and yeah it's funny and i i laugh throughout that entire movie because i think it's a hilarious movie because it takes a jab at so much so many pretenses that we don't think about And that's one of them. Okay, if he got on a ship. And this is Matthew's account. Now Luke didn't say that he got anywhere and did anything. It's Matthew. Because I'm not trying to I'm not trying to coddle Matthew under my wing here and protect him from criticism. I have to think about all of this stuff. Because one of the things I would ask somebody if they said, okay, and Jesus entered into a ship and now what we're supposed to be in Palestine right we're supposed to be in Palestine so if he entered into a ship then he's probably getting onto a ship in the Sea of Galilee and all the people would be on the shore and how is his voice projecting to them from a ship or a boat that he's on all the way to the shore So it's a reasonable question. Even if that ship is moored to a dock, you know, ships have a certain draft. They have to keep away from the shore because of their draft. Um, my answer is this. Now, I believe there is a veracity to the Gospels, you see. I am operating off of that presumption and I'm not hiding it I do believe that's the case because everything else that I see in the Old Testament leading up to this tells me that this all makes sense I'm just saying that I don't necessarily believe in these accounts being for one thing even the most accurate accounts and I believe Matthews is the most accurate have all been preserved to us very well and at the same time, as well as they might be preserved for us, I think a lot of what they had back then, because I think they had technology back then, and better than we have today, we are in the midst of a dark age today. Understand that. We are in the midst of the dark ages. We are in the day of Yahweh. Still, this is a dark age. So, if you asked me, what I would say is he probably got on a ship or a boat that had loudspeakers and spoke to them through the loudspeakers. Because if not, if he did not have some way to project his voice a lot, there's no way people are going to be able to hear him. If it was just him, on a boat that was far out enough, whether it be on a pier or whatever else, and the people were standing on shore, they would still, if it was one person, if it was him on one boat on a dock and one person on the shore, they might still have trouble hearing him without him shouting. It's just an observation. It's just an honest observation. I'm trying to say that there is no way these people 
were running around wearing old torn up blankets and throwing sticks and stones at each other and open toed sandals. That's just stupid. It just doesn't make sense. He would have had to have been on a vessel that had some sort of technology to project his voice. Now we have that today. We're in the midst of a dark age today and we have that today. So let's see. Are the accounts of the sower in Luke, are they parallel to that in Matthew? Well, in Luke, he says, a sower went out to sow his seed and he sowed. Some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Okay. Now Matthew says, Behold, the sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came down and devoured them up. That's pretty good so far. Continuing in Luke. And some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Matthew. And some fell upon stony places, not the same as a rock, where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Back to Luke. And some fell upon a rock, not stony places, a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Matthew. Why did it wither away? When the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root. Because they had no root. No root and no moisture are very different. Luke 8, 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Matthew, And some fell upon thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Wow, that's like right on the money. Luke, And others fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he said these things, he cried, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now that's a lot different. That's actually giving us a graduated degree of produce. I would say that's different. And if you didn't have Matthews to see that graduated degree of produce, which I think is important because some people produce more fruit than others, but he's still giving the ones that produced only 30-fold some props as well as the 100-fold. Luke's not. If you don't produce a hundredfold, I guess you're not getting any props from him today. Now, continuing, I have a little bit more in Luke 8, and then I, I will wrap this episode of Let's Consider Luke up. Now, the next little part, I would say, is, is more than slightly insignificant. You see, it's directly after this in Luke. In Luke 8, 9, it says his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said to them, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. And then he goes on to explain this parable that he just told. And this is in the account of Luke. In Matthew, though, after he tells this same parable, it says in Matthew 13.10 that the, the disciples came to him and said to him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? 
They didn't ask him, what does that parable mean? They said, why do you speak unto them in parables? Who are they talking about? They're talking about the Yudim. The Yudim, not the Jews. The Yudim, those of Judah. Why are you speaking to them in parables? This is important. Go back to Luke. The disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? They're asking for a breakdown of just that parable. But in Matthew, they ask him, Why are you speaking to the people in parables? That is a completely different question with entirely different implications. And in Matthew, you show answers them in full. If I was reading just Luke, I might not really get the full scope as if I were reading Matthew. Now in Matthew, it says that he answered and he said to them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it is not given that's that's all he's saying he's not he's not saying anything more but he's saying because it's given to you it's given to certain people that i've chosen that the father yahweh has revealed to me and i've chosen to you it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven is a mystery to most people at this point in time. And I posit to you that the kingdom of heaven is very much parallel with what we understand Yom Yahweh to be, the day of the Lord. It's important. Why do I think it's important? Because the kingdom of heaven as we see it expressed in Matthew, so it would actually be the Melakut Eshemaim, the kingdom of the, the sky. He named the Rikio Eshemaim, of the air, not of the land. It is so important to see the significance of land throughout the so-called Old Testament, but now we see him speaking of this kingdom of the air, not of the land. But in Luke, he repeatedly refers to the kingdom, the Malakut Aliyim, which is quite different. It is not a parallel. It is not a synonym. We say it's a synonym, but when we, when we break it right down to the wording and concepts, it's not a synonym. And I think that's very important because there would be this kingdom, not of the land, for quite some time that would be in existence during the day of the Lord, Yom Yahweh, this day of judgment, which was darkness to the children of Israel and not light. This is all really, really important stuff in our understanding of what's going on, the big picture. Now he continues in Matthew and he says, For whosoever has, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whomsoever doesn't have, from him shall be taken away even what he has. These are important concepts. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing, don't see, and hearing, they don't hear, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, by hearing, you will hear, and shall not understand. And seeing, you will see, but you will not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. He's literally saying that Yahweh has seen to it that these people just like we are seeing in our own day and time, when we wonder why on earth, why on earth can these people not hear reason? It's so obvious. I can show them every possible 
bit of evidence that is just as plain as day, and they won't hear, and they won't see. Because their heart is waxed fat. That's what he means by gross. Their heart is waxed fat, and their ears are dull of hearing. And he said, if they should understand with their heart, then they would be converted, and I would heal them. And don't say, oh, well, he wouldn't do that to blood Israelites. Well, of course he would. Read the entire Bible. Of course he would. He did that to many, many, many blood Israelites. And then he says, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear the things which you hear, and have not heard them. Why? Because many prophets wrote what they were told to write. Many prophets saw things and wrote down what they saw, but they didn't understand them. It's a very important point he's making. And a lot of material here that will help our understanding in Matthew, and we get none of that in Luke. We get none of it in Luke. You know, and the thing is, the interpretation of the parable of the sower isn't even the same. See, because in Luke 8, 11, he says, Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside, so the words, the words of Aliyim, the words of Yahweh. Those by the wayside are those that heard. And then in Luke, he says, then comes the devil, that big bad devil. The devil comes. It's not people's fault, it's the devil. And he takes the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now in Matthew, he says to them, oh, I'm not far enough forward, sorry about that. Um, yeah, yeah. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one. He starts out, he says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. I'm explaining the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, now that's significantly different than what he said in Luke. It's already significantly different. And doesn't understand it. He says, when he hears those words but doesn't understand it, then comes the wicked. And they added one to make it sound maybe a little more devilly. He said, then comes the wicked and catch away that which was sown in his heart. So when he hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the wicked one comes. So those without understanding, when they hear it, they don't understand it. The wicked one comes, it catches away that was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. That's a completely different word picture than what we get in Luke. Luke says it was the devil. Devil, devil, it was a devil. It takes a word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. That's not what Matthew says. He doesn't say, lest they believe and be saved. Matthew doesn't say that. Now, I won't start Matthew, going back to Luke. Okay. They on the rock, they on the rock, and then they add, are they? They on the rock, which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root. Uh, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. Matthew, however, says, <laughs> He that received the seed into stony places, remember, not on the rock, into stony places, it is different. I'm not splitting hairs. It is different. The same is he that hears the word, and anon, with joy, receive it. 
I don't know, anon. I'm sorry, that, that's a word that's so antiquated. I don't know exactly what that means. Anonymous? Q anon? Anyways, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, he endures for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. By and by he is offended. And these have no root for which believe, but in time of temptation fall away. Now, in time of temptation falling away, and he that, uh, for when tribulation or persecution arise, because of the word, he's offended. This is saying something quite different, my friends. Now, Luke continues, and that which fell among the thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Matthew 13.22 He also that received seed among the thorns is he that hears the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful now that was actually very close and then Luke eight fifteen. but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart having heard the word keep it and bring forth fruit with patience Matthew thirteen twenty three. but he that received seed into good ground is he that hears the word and understands it which also bears fruit and brings forth some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. Matthew says, He that receives seed into the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it. Luke, but he on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word in an honest and good heart, my heart's good, it's honest. Have you ever heard the, the Mormon? And I'm just picking on Mormons. When they give their testimony, you might, don't you understand? I got a good heart. But he's not saying that. He's not saying honest and good heart in Matthew. In Matthew, he's saying that he hears it and he understands. He hears it and he understands stands it my people perish not for lack of a good heart i've got a good heart i heard it my heart's good but he who hears the word and understands it my people perish because of a lack of knowledge because of a lack of knowledge and all those people out there that keep using masoretic references and keep going in those circles. They are not doing it according to understanding and knowledge, and they are going to fall into a ditch and drag the people listening to them down into that ditch with them. Now, the one last thing I'm going to bring up, Luke 8, 26, is at the end it says, Jesus heals a man with a demon. So after this, after Luke says that um, he had said these things, and it says that uh, there is the incidence of his mother and brothers, which is out with Matthew, of course, that um, the, the continuity is, is entirely different. The, um, the chronology is extremely different, extremely off. Then in Luke, it's the part where he calms the storm, and then it says that he heals a man with a demon. Now, in Matthew, we would find something very similar to that. Of course, everything else we've had to deal with is, is entirely out of order with Luke, by the way. Okay? Now, in Matthew, it's interesting because he does calm the storm in Matthew in 8. And then it, there's the account that he heals the man with... Well, I know actually in Matthew, it's two men. It's two men. It's two men, and, and it is quite different. 
Yeah. So here's something that's interesting. Now in the two accounts, they are, are kind of parallel, except of course in Luke there's one man, and in Matthew there's two. If I were a judge and somebody was telling me about an incident they said was true, and one guy said there was two men there and this happened, and the other guy said there was one man there and this happened, I would find those two testimonies to be incredulous. Somebody is telling me the truth, and someone is either lying or they need glasses. Now, I could go into the specifics. I'm not really going to. I am going to mention this, though. This is really important. Now, I'm going to just end it with this. Um, in Luke's account, it said that he crossed over the Sea of Galilee and came to the country of the Gadarenes. Okay. In Matthew, it says, And when he had come to the other side, into the country of the Gergesenes. That's a real problem. That is a serious issue. Now, real quick, in Luke, I'm going to select Galilee. Just checking real quick. Hmm. That's what I thought. So in Matthew, when it says that they were in a sea, a body of water, and they came to the country of the Gergeshines, not the Gadarenes, totally different. In Luke, it says that they were on the Sea of Galilee, but in Matthew, it does not. In Matthew, they come to a country of people that are called the Gergesenes. And it does not say that they were on the Sea of Galilee. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because, first off, the closest match you can get in the Old Testament is the Gergeshi which I would say that's like a dead-on match, okay? Gergeshi were a very old Canaanite tribe. You see, this Canaan, this uh, fourth son of Ham, he had a number of tribes born from him, among whom were the Jebusite, the Amorite, and the Gergesite from Genesis 10:16. It says, when Abraham was in Canaan, that the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergeshites, and the Jebusites were in the land. This was an old tribe of people. And they're still around. We can see them in Deuteronomy 7, they're mentioned as one of the tribes that were existing in the land of Canaan that were greater and mightier than Israel. That's correct. They were greater and mightier than Israel. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergeshites, and the Hivites. In Joshua 24, 10 and 11, we have them in Nehemiah. This is after them coming back from Babel. And found his heart faithful before thee, and made a covenant with thee to give to the land of Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites. So he's actually referring back. Never mind. Shut my mouth. However, what's interesting is that in Matthew it says they came into the country of the Kyrgyzines. That means they were still around. This would have to be a really big place. Because as we saw in Joshua and Judges, they did not displace or in some cases exterminate the people they were told to. They left them there and they put them to tribute. This means that seven tribes greater than you 
not to mention the Philistines and all of the border tribes and the ones that aren't even mentioned. Puts us in the neighborhood of 20, 30 million at the time of Joshua and Judges. And they're still around. They're still around, and we know they're still around because in Matthew it says they came to the country of the Gergeshines. And they did not have to be on the so-called Sea of Galilee. The only match to that is going to be found in the Old Testament under Kunrut, Yum Kunrut. What a lot of people don't understand is you will also find another sea in the Old Testament if you pay close attention. Mikmatet. Mikmatet. We don't know what sea they were in. We don't even know if they weren't on the Great Sea and sailed down or up to the country of the Gergeshines, who are a completely different people than those of the Gadarenes, if we're looking at Gadarenes. Why? Well, this is really important because we can find Gedder. We have one, uh, one town that's actually mentioned in Joshua called Beit Gedder. But we also have, let's see, H1443. And I'm kind of doing this as I go, so forgive me. We can go down. Um, so Gedder is oftentimes used for a wall, actually making a, a wall actually more like an enclosure like for sheep and livestock and things like that, a getter. We do have places that are named Gadara. Um, there's a lot of place names with this, this getter. Um, one of the cities that Judah had was Gadara. Um, so they couldn't have been getting there on the Sea of Galilee, could they? Remember, Luke says they're on the Sea of Galilee. Um, and then we have a number of Israelites who have names that are very much like Geder and Gadara. We have the Gederati mentioned in 1 Chronicles 12.4, Israelite. We have the Gadari in 1 Chronicles 27 and 28, and over the olive trees and sycamore trees that are in the low plains, Belhanan, the Gadari, was over the sellers of oil. He was an Israelite. He was a Gadari. Um, Gedarut. So these are cities, Beth Shemesh, Ailon, and Gedarut. These are near the land of the Palestine, not Philistines. Uh, in Joshua 15.41, these are cities of Judah, Gadrut. You're not getting to a city of Judah on the Sea of Galilee. Now we have Gadara, Joshua 15.36, in Judah, Gadara, and Gederothaim. This is all in Judah, and you're not getting there on the Sea of Galilee. Again, hedges fold sheep coats because it probably means a wall or a hedge in a sense. And then there are, there are passages which make mention of the name Geter as, again, somebody of Israel. But there's also Joshua 12, 13, the king of Debir, one, the king of Gader, one. Now, that's a lot of information to sort through. But the one thing I can guarantee you is that the Gedari are not the Gergeshi. The country of the Gedarines is not the country of the Gergeshines. Luke says they were on the Sea of Galilee. He says, actually, the country of the Gedarenes, which is over against Galilee. But he does say they were on the Sea of Galilee. Luke 8.26. And Luke 5.17.8.26. Over against Galilee. Actually, he doesn't. He just says over against Galilee, which is really interesting because if you pay close attention to the Old Testament, the 
the area, the region of the Galil is not around this Yom Kun root. It's not around Yom Kun root. And we have a completely different people. All right, so if I was giving a testimony and I said that, yeah, and the next thing he did, he went to Chinatown. Somebody else gets up, they give their testimony, and they said, well, yeah, I mean, he went to Little Italy. That's enough contradiction in stories for me to at least exclude one of those witnesses. It's not just a little thing. If they had spelled it a little differently, if in Greek it was just well, it's it's just they they just used um, they just used the Z instead of the S. I mean, you know, it's a transliteration thing. And that would be one thing, but it's not. It's clearly saying the country of the Gadara, which is near the Galil, that's important because we we may be able to actually use that and, and see that, oh, there's a country of Gadara that's near the Galil. That doesn't necessarily make Luke's account accurate just because he gives us a piece of information that we may be able to use to figure out geography. The fact that he names the country they went to in a parallel account as the Gadarenes when Matthew clearly names it the Gergeshi, and they're absolutely different. You cannot parallel those two in any way, shape, or form. They are saying absolutely different things. And with that, I'm going to leave it off at Luke 8, and I will pick it up next time with Luke 9, unless I go over Luke 8, 26, and this account of the one man, as opposed to two men, and I find something there that I need to just touch on briefly next time. Keep in mind, a guy like Norman Geisler, who I would not trust any further than I can throw him, and he's put some weight on, so I don't think it would be very far. Literally trying to harmonize these two accounts said, well, if there's one man, or, or I'm sorry, he says, well, if there's one man, then there's two men, because whenever there's two men, there's always one man. That's the kind of logic these folks use. And I don't trust people that use that kind of logic. So until next time, take care.